Hey everyone, it's Mike with For The Nation Podcast. Before we get to the episode, I want to share that sex trafficking can be a dark and disturbing topic. However, it's important that we educate ourselves so that we can help do our part to end the suffering and help victims. If you or someone you know is affected by sex trafficking, please call the number below or list it in the show notes. That said, today's guest is a champion for women and children affected by sex trafficking. She is the founder and CEO of GLM2 Foundation, which aims to transform victims' lives and really help them flourish. Her name is Kimberly McDonald Walden. And without further ado, let's get to the episode. Everything's good. Everything's there. All right, cool. I do want to get to that game, though. So can well, we do that not, right after I just kind of yeah, get this not, introduction going? It's not really going? a game. It's just a situation, it's a, right? Yeah. If I put you in a situation, I'm right. going to explain how quickly things can be done. All righty. All right. Well, before we do that, let me just kind of introduce you. I'm sitting here with Kimberly McDonald Walden. I said that correctly? Yes. She is the founder of GLM2 Foundation, which stands for God Loves Me Too Foundation okay. Incorporated. Um, go ahead and just kind of take a, a couple minutes or however long you want and just kind of introduce yourself. Who is Kimberly McDonald Walden? Well, as you said, I'm the founder <laughs> and CEO of GLM2. Um and uh, what we do is we provide safe dwelling places and long-term aftercare for women and their children who've been affected by sex trafficking and domestic violence. So um, we come alongside people for a minimum of two years and a maximum of five. Wow. Um, the reason being is that when you're working with trafficking survivors, most of the ones that we work with, have been addicted to things like meth and heroin and stuff like that, right? And um, so they come out of a short-term facility, which short-term facilities are great, but most are 30, 60, 90 days, maybe a year. Most, you can't have your children with them, mm -hmm. with, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it takes your brain 14 months to abstain off of meth before synapses really start connect again and 18 to 24 months before you really start thinking clearly again. Right. So now if you think of the numbers I just told you, 30, 60, 90 days in a short-term facility, and it yeah. takes your brain 14 months, <laughs> right? Right, yeah, you you're nowhere near you haven't yeah. dealt. You haven't dealt with trauma. You haven't dealt with anything. You've just had a drug out of your system, basically. You know, and the short-term facilities do what they're supposed to do. I kind of akin them to an emergency room, right? You, right. you know, if, let's say if you were in a car accident, and you had to have surgery in the emergency room. You don't go back to the emergency room for meds. You don't go back to the emergency room for follow-up. You don't go back to the emergency room for physical therapy, right? Mm -hmm. We have systems in place for that. Um, what happens in most um, situations and, and issues that we have in society is there's truly no long-term care, right? So when they come out of a 30, 60, you know, 90-day program, don't have a job, don't have a place to live. Oh, by the way, here are your kids back. Right. You know, now you've got to take care of them too. You haven't dealt with the trauma. This drug is still in your system. It's a, you know, it's a recipe for failure because people always want to say, let's go rescue, let's go rescue, let's go rescue. And I'm like, then what? What are you going to do with them? What are you going to do with yeah. them when they get out? Right. Nobody asks that question. Everybody wants to, let's go rescue, which is great. Don't get me wrong. Right. But there has to be, system set up for after that to yeah. be able to help them uh live a you know normal life right i love that yeah it's like a holistic approach that yeah really like looks after the long-term care yeah. it's not just like a, hey we did our job <laughs> next check, check the box right let's go. right so um before i do want to get into all that stuff but we were talking before this just kind of like how pervasive social engineering is and to bring awareness to parents like hey a perfect stranger could come in and get all sorts of information from your kids, and they just don't know what they're doing. Um, and you were about to go through this little situation w with me. Would you so, care to yeah. do that? So, so traffickers are very manipulative. Mm -hmm. uh, most go um, after vulnerabilities, right? And um, so if, like you and I were just talking, mm -hmm. and you said you have a child, right? And so now I know that you have a child. So let's say I'm a trafficker, and I'm getting to know you, right? And then... Let's say I meet your wife, and I go, hey, you know what? Your wife is really beautiful, and would you, would, would you guys be interested? So Tim Tebow is doing this thing for Night to Shine, 
All right. And he's doing a calendar and all this other stuff and, you know, taking pictures of families and, you know, and want, want to be able to sell this for night to shine. Would you be interested? You know, we can do a photo shoot. So the whole family comes to the photo shoot. It's legit. They take the pictures. They show you the proofs. I mean, they just, everything, it's a legitimate thing, right? right? So you go, oh, well, this is so cool, right? And they're like, all right, we're going to submit you, right, to Tim Tebow mm-hmm. to see if he picks you. So they wait a couple of weeks, right? Tim Tebow is a legitimate person. Yeah, he is. Night to Shine is a legitimate person. You know, yep, yep, and a part purpose. of it. It's a, right, it's a great, me too, right. me too, right? So it's like, yeah, this is awesome. This would be so cool, right? Yeah. And who wouldn't want to go meet Tim Tebow, right? So anyway, they wait a couple of weeks, and they, they call you back, and they go, hey, Mike, here's the deal. You guys have been chosen. You've been chosen. They are going to fly you first class out to Los Angeles, all right, and basically do a professional photo shoot with your family and they give you the ticket they give you everything you get out there and they go okay we're going into this area right here all right tim tebow's in the next room what we're going to do is um we but we need you to leave your phones right here okay please leave your phones etc here because we have professional photographers right all right so we want you to leave that there and then you go in and there's no tim tebow and now somebody says um, to your wife, "I need you to take your clothes off." Oh yeah, and I yeah, need you. I, I need you to go ahead and do that. And and you, as a man, are going to go, <laughs> no. And they are going to hold you with gunpoint or whatever, and say, "Let me explain something to you. If she doesn't do that, I'm going to have five men come in and violate your child in front of you. Her clothes are coming off." Yeah, that's uh, you know, and it's 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 people manipulate and they are so and it's sad in today's world that you can't trust like you should be able to trust. Mm-hmm. But think about that situation and you're an adult. All right. Now think about kids online. They're talking to people who they think are the same age as them. All right. And they're having a this this happened to my neighbors child he texted me one night and said i think my daughter's being groomed for trafficking and i got all the information i said yep she sure is i said get me all of her electronics we have to have you know i'm calling my task force guy and get all the electronics all the passwords all the social media accounts you know and we'll get him on it right and they were able to locate who this was and found him and that wow. was that. But she was being groomed. And by the way, this was a 38-year-old 30 year African-American male in Rio de Janeiro talking to her and another little girl on Washington Road, pretending to be a 14-year-old. Wow. Okay, pretending to be a 14-year-old. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and that's the other thing. I always, you know, caution parents. I'm like, please make, you know, f- number one, your child should have no privacy in your house. It's your house. Stop being the friend. <laughs> yeah. Okay, stop being the friend. They can be gone like that. All right? And secondly is, you know, know all of their accounts and all of their passwords. Because if someone goes missing, the first thing FBI, any police officers, whatever, are going to ask, uh, what, what is the password to their phone? What is the password to their TikTok account? And most parents are like, I, I don't know. When I was growing up, I'm a lot older than you, mm-hmm. but when I was growing up, I was taught my phone number, my address, every, you know what I'm saying? Like, I knew all of that stuff. Right. Right now, these days, parents, it's reversed, but parents don't know the information on their children. And what's worse is they don't know who they're talking to online. Okay, all these, you know, game gaming um, apps. All of you know, I mean, like my my neighbor's child. It was it started on Roblox and went to Discord. You know, and these chat rooms get smaller and smaller. And as they do, right? That's the scare. Like the bigger chat rooms are not that big of a deal, but the smaller chat. I always tell parents if you don't personally know somebody that they're talking to, the answer's no. 
the answer is no, because you don't know who is pretending on the other end. Yeah. You have no idea. You know, like there was a 17-year-old little boy who, um, fo- captain of the football team, you know, living the dream, yeah. right? Yeah. Already had scouts looking at him for college, Right. Mom and dad go to a good church. Dad's deacon in the church. He has a five-year-old little brother. He starts talking to a 22-year-old girl online. And after a few months, the conversation turns sexual. They decide to meet. He goes and gets flowers, and it's going to be all suave and debonair and all that, right? Shows <laughs> yeah, up yeah. He's thinking he's a hero at this he's point. He's a hero. Yeah, yeah well, well, you know, like I said, he thinks he's all that in a bag of chips because he's talking to a little 22-year-old hottie, right? Right, yeah, yeah. So he goes and knocks on a hotel room door, and he's met by a 45-year-old man. Oh, God. Who drags him in, beats him, and says, let me tell you how this is going to go down. You're going to do exactly what I tell you to do, okay? Or I'm going to go to your football team, because just so you know, nowhere in the conversation did I ever say that I was a girl. You just thought that because of a picture. So I'm going to go to your football team, and I'm going to tell them you're gay and you like older men. And then I'm going to go to your church and I'm going to embarrass your parents. And you'll probably lose the scholarships that you're looking at, by the way. And oh, oh, when you have that five-year-old little brother, I'll kill him. Okay. A 17-year-old little boy, his frontal lobe is not developed. Okay. His frontal lobe's not developed. Now, you and I know. Get out of that room no matter what. Even if you get hurt, get out of the room, go downstairs, call the police, call your parents. No amount of embarrassment is worth your life. Mm -hmm. That little boy was trafficked. It's like, it's almost just like uh, the words escape you. It's so devastating, so disgusting, vile. I don't, you know. Yes. Um, How did you... What did you do before this, if I could start there? Oh, I did a lot of different things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like a lifetime ago, I, uh, I used to produce commercials and music videos in Los Angeles. And then uh, when I moved back, I was actually focusing on music because I'm a musician, singer, songwriter as well. And so back in the day, I had uh, done a lot of stuff in country music. I had opened up for really? Billy Ray Cyrus and opened up for Waylon Jennings before he died and you know, work with Garth Brooks, Trisha Yearwood. Anyway, it, you know, again, oh, anyway, these, are li- yeah. <laughs> no, these are lifetimes ago, you know. And then um, I actually started working in uh, for a developer here for ATC Development and had a 20-year career there and, you know, in new construction. Mm-hmm. And we built townhomes and apartment complexes. And then um, God called me away to do what I'm doing now. You know, yeah. and everybody thought I was out of my mind, but I left my day. J- I, I started um, GLM2 in um, 2015 is when I actually started the nonprofit. Mm-hmm. But then I had to have six life or death surgeries to keep me here. Kind of had to put everything on hold. And then in 2018, um, it was like it was time. And so in 2018, I walked away from everything I knew as security and... Yeah. Here I am now. So you go from producing commercials, music videos, to country music, to then being uh, working with development, and then starting this nonprofit. And you said that you felt called to do it. What What was that that made you feel called to this? Was there like a specific moment, something that happened in your life? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of specific moments that took place. Um, but one, literally somebody... I was on a medical mission trip and someone actually came up to me and said, I've got a word of the Lord for you. And I went, okay. And yeah, one of those like, okay. You know, she said transitional housing. And I was like, all right, God, what is that? Like, what does that mean? You know, and I, I, I didn't hear anything, didn't know anything, you know, was praying about it. Um, and then, uh, came back and, uh, I went to hear someone speak, and she told the story of how her mother was a prostitute and started prostituting her out at the age of three. And I just wept that whole time. 
And it was just those kinds of things that kept happening. It kept being, I, I'd never heard of trafficking. In yeah. Korea. So th this thing started happening and it was just, it was overwhelming, like to the point you, you can't sleep at night, right? Mm -hmm. and, and all of this stuff. And so it was just like, okay, something's got to be done. Like, and so I started researching and, and meeting with people and, and, and finding out as much information as I could. And that's when I said, like, you know, I realized it was like, there's a huge gap. Like, right. There's a lot of short term stuff, but there's nothing that helps them really these survivors move forward. And so our lane, just so you know, GLMT's lane, we are 18 and older and they're children. Okay, because we found that most of the time when um, mom has been trafficked, the child has as well or has experienced some sort of abuse. And the reason we do domestic violence as well is because most of the time we find that when um, a girl has been, let's say, you know, we have a girl that was trafficked by her mom, okay? And when that takes place, then as they get older, every relationship is domestic violence because that's all they know is, to be, is the abuse, right? right. So we, we, we encapsulate, you know, both of those so that we can help people heal from that. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not just the the healing; it's it's flourishing after the fact. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. And understand that you know recovery, and especially with trauma, you know. And I'll I'll talk to you a little bit about trauma as well. But with recovery is not necessarily the absence of trauma; it just means those that trauma, those triggers, don't control your life, and you have healthier coping mechanisms, mm -hmm. right? That you've you've developed a healthier way to deal with something. Right, that if you have anger instead of punching a hole in the wall, right, like there's grounding exercises that you can do, or go for a walk, or you know that kind of thing, so that you're not, you know, exuding these emotions based on a trigger that just happened. You recognize this is a trigger, um, and a lot of people don't understand what triggers are, right? And it can be anything. It can be a song. It could be lighting. It could be. I mean, anything like, right. you know, when, when I first started this, a lot of my friends uh, were like, hey, we can get you, you know, shampoos and conditioners and, you know, soaps and all that stuff because we travel. We'll give you all the hotel stuff. Right. I'll save you a ton of money. And I was like, no, I can't do that. And they were like, well, we don't understand. I'm like, your heart's in the right place, but the execution is wrong because that's what these folks use to clean up between clients. Right, I will set off PTSD in a big way. Yeah, you know, not only that, but how devaluing, you know, after all you've been through, right? Being sold twenty-five to forty times a day for sex, <sighs> right? After all you've been through, that you don't deserve a full-size bottle of shampoo, right? It it, it, yeah. it it's rebuilding them as people that, and reminding them that they're human beings mm -hmm. because they've been sold as a product. And when someone is sold, you know, in trafficking, when someone is sold for sex, right, because a lot of people just think, oh, it's just sex. I'm like, no. No. So if someone purchases you, well, first of all, they don't care anything about you. Yeah. Right? They could care less about you. You are a means to an end. That's it. You're a product. Like, I'm consuming this water. They're going to consume you. So let's say they've purchased you for an hour. So in that hour, yes, you will be raped. You may be sodomized. You may be cut, beaten, burned, branded, um, urinated on, defecated on, choked out. And that's one client. And that happens 25 to 40 times a day. It's so disturbing. I, I can't believe people, I mean, you don't want to talk about this, but it's it's so pervasive and I, I want to talk about like the reality of human trafficking um georgia's ranked the seventh highest trafficking seventh highest in the u.s for trafficking rate. it might be uh old data i think that's 2017 so uh one thing that we've learned is it's gotten more rampant since then for sure um this is also this podcast is coming on the heels of the sound of freedom movie mm -hmm. uh that's kind of what inspired me to find an uh, organization such as yours uh, to have this conversation because i think the one thing that that movie left me with was, okay, what's next? Like I know about this, but what's next? Um, so if you could kind of like 
in your own words, summarize what is the reality of human trafficking today? So you said like 25 to 40 times well, uh, they would and, be sold And it a day. happens here mm -hmm. like all the time. You know, people, I haven't seen the movie just because I work with enough trauma on a daily basis yeah. that I don't need to go sit to know what goes on. Mm -hmm. um, but people need to understand that it happens not just in your own backyard, but in your own home. Okay, when, again, when your child or whomever is online, right, and it's happening in your own home, you don't even, you don't even know that it's happening. Right. right. People think, oh, well, that happens in Mexico or that happens, you know, somewhere else or in the bigger cities or whatever. No, it happens right here in your own house. It happens every single place, every single day, everywhere. All right. So it is rampant. And in Augusta, Georgia, is number one for child pornography. We outrank Atlanta. How about that? Really? Really, that's really. so crazy. The yeah. um, one thing I've I've heard I I don't know if this is true, but the Masters tournament they have no affiliation with producing it or promoting trafficking, but for some reason it brings um, large amounts of trafficking during those couple of weeks. Do you know so, why? Why is that? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, um, it it highlights the trafficking, but. What ha so the number one buyer of sex on the planet is the white American male. Traffickers follow the money. All right. Masters brings in lots of white American males. So does the Super Bowl. It could also be a computer geek convention in Vegas. Mm -hmm. They're following the money. You know, but it happens every day. It's just highlighted more during big sporting events and things like that, you know, right. because there's lots of media and stuff like that, right? You don't have media just hanging out on a street corner in Augusta, Georgia, looking for trafficking. Mm -hmm. Now that we know that it's going on, like the movies kind of brought it to light and um, it's being talked about a little bit more, like what, what are the next steps? So, ne I mean, you can always donate. My gosh, we, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it takes... A lot of money. You know? I'm sure. I mean, we're currently working with 24 adults and 40 children here. Okay. So wherever you are in your own backyard, you know, look for local organizations. Mm -hmm. All right. Because we always need financial help. Always. Um, find out if you can volunteer. Most of the boots on the ground stuff. Um, now, I'll go do boots on the ground. I have someone I work with and we'll go get them. Um, but we also work with other organizations so that if we are doing a rescue, right, we're already set up to, we're either taking this person to, um, a hospital, depending on their condition, detox or to a safe home, right? So all of that has already been set up before we go get somebody, right? Because most of the time, um, they have to be the ones to call in. Right. They have to ask for help. Right. You can't just you can have somebody killed and get yourself killed if you see someone and think, I'm just going to go help them because they are always being watched. You know, but that's why we have, you know, especially in Georgia. I mean, we have our own human trafficking hotline, like the jo Georgia Coalition Against Human Trafficking. We have that hotline, which is fantastic. You know, we, we have GBI here, which is amazing, you know, um, and uh, Governor Kemp and First Lady Kemp, you know, they changed some laws, put some laws into place that make it easier for trafficking survivors to change their names, also to be able to get, you know, restitution from, from their uh, abusers mm -hmm. as well, monetary restitution. Right, so, right. you know, so, so. There, there are things that are already happening. There are things that in, are in play. Um, but, but like I said, you know, most people, they, you know, they go see this movie and then they, they're gung-ho. And, and it's like, well, just because you have a, a, a big heart, right, my first thing is educate yourself, right? It's like, right. let's go help, okay? You want to help. You want to volunteer, all right? So what do you do if... if you're transporting somebody and you play a song on the radio and it's a trigger and they 
bust out the glass in your car. Are you prepared for that? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because people want to help how they know how to help, right? But you have to understand these survivors, they don't, they're not going to think like you. They're not going to act like you. They don't look like you. They don't smell like you. They don't talk like you, right? So if you're going to volunteer, you actually have to volunteer how, um, how the organization needs you to volunteer so that you're not putting yourself at risk ever and, uh, and that you're also doing, you know, best interest, best practice for the survivor. Yeah. So I guess along that line, like what are some things that um, you could teach us to like to look for to, to maybe be like, oh, like if you see it happening, what are you supposed to do? Call local law enforcement, call National Human Trafficking Hotline, call uh, the Georgia Coalition, mm-hmm. you know, hot, hotline as well. Um, and I'll give you guys some business cards as well. We have hotline numbers on the back of them. Perfect. Um, and uh, and I have lots of resources on our website and stuff too because our website isn't just about GLM2. I, I, I like having resources where people can, you know, look up stuff and, and educate themselves on things because education is a huge thing, right? So, because what happens is this, um, people are on social media and they, you know, my gosh, the, the white van has, you know, become the target. I'm like, what if I'm a caterer? (laughs) (laughs) I'm not trafficking. I'm just delivering food, you know? I just got a Ford Transit. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. But everybody goes, oh, I saw a white van park near, Okay. That's great, you know, or there's a cable tie on, you know, your side view mirror or those kinds of things. Okay, please understand that people want to sensationalize things. That's not trafficking, okay? Kidnapping, molestation, rape, that's not trafficking. I'm not discounting those things. Please yeah, don't yeah. think that, okay? Right. But trafficking, you have to be... it. it Someone has to be caused to commit a commercial sex act through force, fraud, or coercion, okay? And that commercial sex act could be, you know, pornography. It could be um, stripping. It could be, you know, your regular sex acts. But it's an exchange of any item of value, okay? Whether that's shelter, whether that's food, clothing, new iPhone, Mm -hmm. money, those kinds of things. It's in exchange for that, right? And please understand the survivors, the the victims are not getting that. It's the pimp. You know, so basically, right, if if you're the buyer, you're basically paying this person, a pimp, to rape somebody else. That's what's happening. You know, it's economics 101. Yeah. You have a demand, you have a supply, you have a buyer, right? And we have to end that demand, right? We have to end the demand yeah. to be able to stop trafficking, right? Because it's, if you're in business for yourself, right? Let's mm-hmm. say if you have a lawnmower business, right? And people stop buying lawnmowers, you go out of business, right? But with trafficking, it's just, it's really, really... A hard thing and and people don't look at things like pornography you know pornography and people think well i'm not hurting anybody i'm like look you don't know what's going on on the other side of that picture right okay you have no idea and this and pornography strip clubs this is where um this is where the uh victims get groomed right they push boundaries yeah because most of the time you know people think about the you know Trafficking in this country is not the movie Taken. It's not the movie Pretty Woman. Okay? That type of kidnapping is 1% in this country. All right? Traffickers get to know you. They'll spend five, six months getting to know you. Yeah. Yeah, it's all about leverage. Right? Before they flip the switch. Right. Exactly. That's exactly, that's the perfect word for it is leverage, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and one of the, one of the things that we talk about a lot of times is, you know, Romeo pimps, right? So they'll s- send a, a guy in that's maybe a couple of years older, right? Start talking to a 15, 16 year old girl. 
right? And every little girl wants to be accepted and loved and, oh my God, this guy's so cute and, you know, all this stuff. And so, you know, your heart's going pitter patter and you can't think straight, right? And then he starts building trust. So let's say dad says, I'm going to pick you up at basketball practice every day at 5 o'clock. And every day dad shows up at 5.30, quarter of 6. Well, this new boyfriend says, don't worry about dad. I'll pick you up. And he shows up at, you know, 4.30. Right. Watching you play, waiting on you. And you're like, oh. So now who's she going to trust? Right. Now she starts trusting the boyfriend makes a comment on social media. I'm mad at mom. She won't get me that new iPhone. I'll get it for you. Yeah. You don't need them. Right? So they literally start alienating you from your friends and family. Right? So, and what happens is the, the the biggest deception is that, you know, when people talk about sex trafficking or human trafficking, you know, they, they flash pictures of people in ropes and chains and, you know, third world country little children and shackles. And, you know, so if this is what's happening to me, right, that I've just met this guy that's going to be, you know, the guy of my dreams, mm-hmm. right, and he loves me because he's doing all these things for me, right, mm-hmm. then it just... It, it all, you know, it all just kind of crumbles very quickly. Yeah. You know, so that, that scenario just keeps, they'll say, hey, let's go away for the weekend. Right? Mm. Go away for the weekend, nothing happens. Right? So I'm trusting. I'm building more trust. I'm building more trust. Then eventually they push more boundaries. Right? Mm -hmm. And then they go, you know what? Why don't you just move in? Why don't you do this? And then they, or maybe move away, right? And then at that point, they say, you know what, babe? Um, I've been taking care of you for like the last six months, and I'm, you know, I'm having, I, I'm embarrassed. I hate to say it, but I'm having some financial problems. Can you just go to this club and dance? It's okay. It's just topless, right? So uh, constantly just pushing the ba- barriers, yeah. pushing the barriers, pushing the barriers. So in their mind, they're thinking, they're not thinking I'm being trafficked because they're like, I left on my own free will. Yeah. Meanwhile, it's obviously right, manipulation. Yeah, but, right. but, but it's like, I don't look like the, the child in, in shackles. Mm-hmm. I left on my own free will. So there's a dissociation right? They don't, they don't recognize it. Yeah. Not only that, but traffickers, you know, they go after the vulnerable. So I'm going to talk just a couple of minutes about the frontal lobe. Okay. When your frontal, your frontal lobe doesn't develop until you're about 25, 26 years old. All right. Just made it. Just made it. Just made it. You know, I have a lot of wives sometimes who go, um, when is my husband's frontal <laughs> lobe? They've I'm been married sure. for 40 years. When is my husband's frontal lobe going to get developed? I'm like, I have no say so in that. Right. Yeah. But, um, but the frontal lobe doesn't, so one of the, one of the, the functions of the frontal lobe is understanding that there are few, there are, there are future consequences for what you do right now. Mm-hmm. Okay, and this is a reason why a 16 year old boy will jump in a, you know, souped up pickup truck, go 90 miles an hour flying through traffic and not even think I could kill somebody. Right. Not even think they can't see me in my side view mirror, you know, or in their side view mirror and I could clip them and kill somebody instantly. Right. So there's there's no, you know, that that cause and effect. There's no that consequence. They, they're not thinking of the consequence. Right, that's a frontal lobe thing, and when I go talk to churches and Girl Scouts and stuff like that, I always use an example. I always try to get one of the the kids in in the audience or whatever to let me use them as an example, right? And I say, you know, if you saw a baby, right, crawling off a stage, you're the only one in the room, and if you saw a baby crawling off the stage, like right at the edge, getting ready to fall, what would you do? And they're like. Well, I, I would go get it. I'm like, why? Well, I don't want it to get hurt. It's not your kid. Yeah, but 
I don't want a baby to get hurt. I'm like, okay, now I need you to understand. Now we're going to switch roles. Now I need you to understand that you're that baby. And I'm the person right now pulling you off that ledge. And your mom and dad, when they say no, you can't go out with this person because they don't know you. Or no, you can't talk to them online because you don't know them. Yeah. They're the ones keeping you from falling off. And I said, it's because your frontal lobe's not developed. Yeah, it's you, not your fault. Yeah, you don't know what you don't know. It, it, it's not your fault. And I said, you, I said, would you put a three-year-old behind the wheel of a car? <laughs> No. To drive, you yeah. know, and they're like, well, no. I'm like, okay, why? Because they're not developed. This is how God made us, right? Every year we have a birthday. Every year we realize we've grown, we've learned, that kind of thing. I said, but, you know, you don't put a three-year-old in front of, a, you know, in the, behind the wheel of a car because they're not developed yet, and it's not their fault. They, I mean, they don't go, yeah. you know, have go home and feel ashamed because they're three years old and can't drive a car, right? But right. But this is why, you know, and, and that's the other thing is that, you know, traffickers, and this is why traffickers go after the vulnerable, right? Because this isn't developed. They know they can pull information. They know they can manipulate you. They know they can do all of these things mm -hmm. and get away with it. Yeah. Like really get away with it. So it's just, you know. Yeah. One aspect I want to go back to, it's, I think it's a really interesting point, is you basically said it's economics 101. There's a demand for it. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's gotten so bad? Like, it, what bugs me is like, and this is just part of it, I'm sure, but like the language has changed the way we view some of these things. We don't call them pedophiles anymore. We call them minor, minor attracted people. Like, they, you know, it, it's just like bizarre language that you're like, no, no, no. It's never been minor attracted person. It's always been pedophilia. It's a bad thing. It's not moral. That's it. So, like... How do we how do we change the demand of this, or why do you think it's gotten so bad in the first place? Well, it's gotten bad. So it used to be when you saw a you know it was called prostitution. Mm -hmm. Right, nobody thought, well, maybe she doesn't want to be doing this. Right, I mean, nobody, right. no one's ever thought of that. You know, it's I, I've never met a little boy or a little girl who said, you know what, when I grow up, I want to be a stripper. <laughs> I want to yeah. be a prostitute. Right. I, I, I've, I've never talked to a child who said, I want to do that. Yeah. Right? Um, but the thing is, is that, so, you know, back in the day, you would see prostitutes on street corners, right? So it was kind of in your face, and you just didn't drive by that part of town, right? You ignored right. it. Yeah. Right? And now, because of technology... It's everywhere. And please understand that the internet, the whole reason for the internet, right, we use it for 4% of what it was created for. Yeah, it's definitely gotten so pervasive. And now it's, it's almost like idolized. I mean, you look at something like OnlyFans. I mean, it's now we, I, you say like, oh, they don't want to grow up and be a prostitute. But now... Now, like some of those women and, and men are idolized right. because, you know, they're because making they a million do. bucks a month. Exactly. Selling explicit photos. And, and that's what they do. So so th when, when, when they can desensitize you, mm -hmm. right? That's why, like we just talked about the name, you know, changing from pedophilia, right? That when they can desensitize you, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, that's, that's not so bad. Right, it's not so bad. And if you look at topics and things that are on just you know television these days or whatever, that you know when I was a kid, those topics weren't talked about. But all of a sudden, as you know, they yeah. start desensitizing, 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 and all of a sudden it's like, oh well, that's just normal. Right, that's just normal. And it's like no, there's a lot of things that aren't just normal. You know, trafficking should never be normal, ever. Mm -hmm. You know, and but in other countries, it's sometimes it's a way of life. Yeah. Right. You go to places like Moldova, and the men don't work. They sit around and smoke and drink and gamble all day long, and they pray they have a little girl, so that they can, you know. They'll 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 go put their kids in school, pull them out to be trafficked, and then put them back in. 
it's just bizarre. Like yeah. I, don't, I don't know the words for that. Like, they have, I mean, in in places like Prague, they have um, the big red light districts and yeah, all that. Well, yeah. Well, it's like if you went downtown Augusta, right, and you just like window shopping downtown Augusta, they have you know kids for sale in the windows in in cages and stuff. They have a platform that they stand out every day and uh, sell uh, newborn babies to American pedophiles. The youngest I've had come across my path is 18 months. That's, it's just sad. I mean. Yes. Yeah. It's pure evil is what it is. It definitely I mean, is. it really is. It's just evil. It's, I, I, I don't have any other words for it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I don't want to call it a sickness or, I mean, it's evil. Yeah. So do you think, this, it's an interesting, I've talked about this before on, on different episodes, but like I remember growing up, it was okay for me to just, you know, walk a mile or two to a corner store, or get some stuff like that. But it, it doesn't anymore. happen anymore. <laughs> do you Not think anymore. that we've gotten more evil as a society or more immoral? Or do you think um, we're just more aware of it? I think a little of both, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I do think a little of both, um, because the now, because of, of technology, technology has made us more aware of everything. Oh yeah. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. it, there's nothing you can't find in technology. Right. But so I think a lot of it has always been there. Technology has now opened the platform for everybody to have access to it. But I do think because of that, it's almost hit like the fast forward button on it. Like, okay, yeah. then let's all do it, right? And it's like, no, 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 let's let's not. Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting because I think social media is also it's allowed people to feel like their every opinion they have is like a good opinion or whatever. Do you know what I'm saying? It, where yeah. it's like, yeah, yeah. That it's like no that. some. Some opinions are just bad. <laughs> right. Exactly. And that would be one of them, like, oh, the whole exactly. minor attractive people. Like, exactly. no, that's just, that's not good, period. Yeah. Um, but one, one of the things I do want to um, talk about as well um, with GLM2 is that we actually do get to see life transformation. Yes. You know, we've been talking about the dark side. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, Please. the lighter side of Please. things. Um, and so, again, like I said, we come alongside of them for a minimum of two years, maximum of five. And, um, you know, we don't have a facility. Eventually, we'll we'll be building, you know, on horse farms and things like that. But um, right now, what we do, um, we we know, like, for the first six months to a year, it takes them that long just to exhale, mm-hmm. just to trust us, right? Because right. they don't trust people on the streets. They don't, you know, they don't trust anybody, Right. So just just to build that trust and sometimes I'll get pushed back just to see, you know, are you leaving? Are you going away? You know, no, we're still here. Right. We're still here. Right. Um, But we know that we're going to have to help them find a place to live. Right. We know that we're going to have to help them um, uh, find a job. You know, and we have a lot of community partners, which, you know, is just wonderful that help us do so many different things, right? And uh, you just had Mike from Peak Employment. Right. You know, and Mike's awesome. Mike and Ashley, they are fantastic. And and they've helped uh, several of my survivors, you know, be able to find jobs that, you know, people give people second chances, right? And they get their foot in the door and then it starts building self-esteem and then they can, you know, move up and things like that. Then they're, they're, they're absolutely awesome. Um, you know, as far as places to live... Um, we can't go to your average apartment complex, right, because they're already going to have the strikes against them, right? And fair housing law says what you do for one, you have to do for all, mm-hmm. right? So they can't make an exception unless the laws change. They can't make an exception to say, hey, can I co-sign or that kind of thing. They can't do that. So we have to find people who have, like, you know, duplexes for rent or you know, cottages or whatever for rent. And we know we're going to, coming in, we're going to be paying the bills, right, for at least the first year. Right. Because, you know, let's say if we're in the middle of the line, you know, we know that they're going to be behind us, you know, and after a while it evens out 
and then they go past us. You know, that's the purpose is for them to go past us where they no longer need us anymore. Right. You know, but the long term plan, um, especially after we built facilities, is um, that the first year they came in, all they would do is um, heal, work, save money. We put them in an escrow program. Second year, they're going to take budgeting skills that we've taught them, uh, pay for rent, power, all of that. They get to practice real life in a safe environment, right, and then find out what they really want to be, you know, let them dream again. Yeah. But by the time they graduate, um, they they would have enough money saved up from that first year in the escrow program that we we're actually able to help them buy their own home. So we're expunging records, we're building credit. You can't do that in a 30, 60, 90 day program. Right. right. It, it does, it, it takes a long time, but it is a success plan, right? So when we've helped somebody buy their own home, right, when we do that, then now you're breaking cycles of poverty, you're breaking generational curses, you're, you know, kids are going to mirror what you do. It's a success plan. Yeah, Ab- yeah, it has to do with human flourishing at that point. A- a- you're, you know, you're healing them along the way, yeah. but to, you're also giving them a platform to a- succeed absolutely. in. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and we, you know, it's, it's to set them up for success and not failure. Not just that, but, you know, we also want to do some, um, what I call preventative medicine, right, which is you know, teaching them um, proactive actions before they happen, right? So let's say, let's say I have a power bill, okay? And all of a sudden I make a mistake in my checkbook and I don't have enough money to pay the whole bill, Mm -hmm. right? Well, I know I can send the power company $50, let's save the bill, and, you know, I can call them and say, hey, I made a mistake, um... I'm going to pay $50, don't turn my power off. Next month, I'll pay the fees, et cetera. I'll get caught back up, right? So I know I can do that. They don't have that skill set. If I can teach them that skill set, then if that ever happens, instead of having a meltdown, right, Mm -hmm. the last thing we want them to do is to think, if I just went back to my abuser, I could pay this bill. If I just turn one trick, I could pay this bill. We don't ever want them looking backwards because if they do and they go back into that life, not only are they gone, they'll be dead. They'll kill them, right? A pimp will kill them for leaving, Wow. right? So we want to always keep them moving forward and always make sure that we have a safe place, right, that they can talk about anything no matter what. And the kids especially, right, the kids that have been through all this trauma, you know, trauma is a... It's an interesting beast. I mean, it really is. And years ago, when I was first getting into this, and I was diving into everything knowledge, right, um, I went to a seminar, and um, a neurologist was speaking. And I asked him afterwards, I said, okay, you got you talked about all the medical stuff, which is way above my pay grade. <laughs> like, I don't know all the, you know, synapses that are, yeah. gonna, you know, I'm sorry, that, that's not me. Um, I said, so I need trauma for dummies. Can you help me out and just give me kind of, <laughs> you know, a baseline of what I'm doing so that I'm helping people, right? Right. And so anyway, and he basically explained this, and it was kind of cool, okay, because this is like, layman's terms trauma for dummies for me right he said you know there's two hemispheres of the brain right side left side right side is um your communication skills i mean excuse me right side is creative side sorry right side is creative side left side is communication skills well you know analytical but it also holds communication skills right he said when trauma hits the brain and it doesn't matter what kind of trauma it is it could be a divorce it could be your dog just died you know, any mm-hmm. kind of trauma. Now, understand recovery from trauma takes different amounts of time. But but when trauma hits the brain, it all hits that right side, which is your creative side. But at the same time, it completely shuts down the left. So, if I've been traumatized, and, this, and people want to put a person in front of a counselor, like immediately, it's like, oh, we'll get them out of here. We got to get them into counseling. Well, if this is happening, if the left side of their brain is shut down, which is your communication skills, 
Yeah, they're not even going to know how to process and you explain what just happened. Yeah, you can't talk. So it would be like me, you know, saying, hey, I'm going to cut off your wrist, Mike, and if you would, just hand me that can. <laughs> you can't. Yeah. Right? So here's what happens. So I know if, I, let, let's say if you're my therapist, and I'm sitting in front of you now, mm. okay, and I know I know how to talk, but I can't talk about this, and I don't know why I can't talk about this. But now I'm sitting in front of you, and I know that you expect something from me. Mm-hmm. I can't give it to you. Therefore, I'm re-traumatized. Okay, so what we do, what we found is that nonverbal therapies, okay, music, arts, you know, it could be gardening, it could be building Legos, it doesn't matter, the, you know, cooking, creative stuff, right, the creative side of things. Also, equine therapy, animal therapy, those kinds of things as well. Um, those help to heal that right side of the brain. And as the yeah. right side of the brain starts to heal, the, you know, then the left side starts to heal, the hemispheres reconnect, then you can see a trauma-informed counselor. Okay, that can take years. Yeah. That can take years, right? And so, we again, we have community partners like um, Hope for Hooves in North Augusta, right? It's a rescue animal farm. And you've never seen anything like it when you see an abused animal and abused human connect and they heal each other. It's the most amazing thing ever. I've been working with them for several years, right? Michelle Derrick, who is a friend and just a fabulous person who owns this animal farm. Um, but the first time we ever met, you know, and I, I, I brought, she had, she had uh, gotten two severely abused mules, had them in the pasture, Nobody could get near them. She couldn't get near them to mm-hmm. feed them nothing. I bring a 14-year-old little boy who had been trafficked up to the horse gate. They came clear across the pasture to him and let them start let him start petting them. And she was like, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Yeah. Right? And it's cool, though, because then all of a sudden these abused animals become less skittish, and then they let other people pet. You know, because her, her deal is to, you know, to rescue Rehab, restore, rehome, so then she can keep doing that, right? Yeah. And so it's uh, it's really interesting for us to see how you know our participants grow, right, and become more verbal and make more eye contact and start to live again, open up again before you know they go to a counselor. Now, you know we all another community partner here in town. Uh, we we partner with um, Family Counseling Center of the CSRA. Right, and they handle trauma counseling, right? Because you have to realize, you know, we're dealing with compound complex trauma. So there's multiple abuse says, mm-hmm. multiple abusers, multiple times. It's a lot. Yeah. Right. So we're very fortunate, like I said, that we have we have so many community partners that we can, you know, work with right. to help people you know, to heal and, and work through what they're going through. Yeah. One thing I want to, I want to touch on, I know that you are currently, you're taking on sponsors or that might've ended for uh, a, f- a 5k that you put on yeah. in October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd love for you to kind of talk about yeah, that absolutely. and, you know, what people could expect if they absolutely. went and joined the race. Absolutely. So, um, we have, uh, this is our fifth annual courage to rise fun run walk. So you don't have to run it. You can walk it. <laughs> um, but, yes, we would love to have uh, sponsors. We're still taking sponsors up until um, August 15th. All right. And um, also, um, we there's two parts to this fun run walk, right? So we have an in-person portion, which takes place on October the 7th, and that's downtown at uh, the Augusta Market at the River, River Walk. Um, we start and end there. We believe in supporting local, so we like to end there so people can actually shop the vendors and stuff like that when the, yeah, when, cool. when everything's done. Uh, it's a family-friendly event. You can bring your dogs. We give away free dog collars while supplies last, GLM2 go- do- uh, dog collars. Um, but the other part of this is we uh, allow uh, people to do it virtually as well, which starts September 23rd. So September 23rd, through October 7th is the virtual portion, all right? People are like, how do you do a virtual run? Well, that means you pick your own 5K. You can be anywhere on the planet and do it, right? We ask them to 
post pictures. We have a most creative video contest. You know, I had a guy ask me one time, so how many steps is a 5K? And I said, <laughs> well, it depends on your stride, right? And I said, but, you know, close to three, 3,000. You know, he said, so in the next two weeks, if I can get from my recliner to my refrigerator and back and get 3,000 steps, and does that count? And went, yes, and I want a video of it, right? So we ask people to get creative, you know, uh, on so stuff. Funny. And ha- yeah, have, have a good time with it. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had people from Tel Aviv doing it. I mean, literally really? everywhere you know, Michigan, Boston. I mean, we just, we've had them everywhere doing it, you know, which is awesome, Yeah. you know, but, but if you register, you know, the key is right now, if you register by August 15th, okay, these are participant registrations. If you register by August 15th, then you qualify to have your name put in the drawings. We do two work, two weeks worth of drawings during that virtual time. We have daily drawings every single day from September 23rd to October 7th. And we're kicking things off by giving away a $500 Amazon gift card. So when you get in there early, right, get your registration in early. And it also guarantees you're going to get a swag bag and a a T-shirt as well. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, but we want people to get in there early because – after August 15th, you can still register all the way up to October 7th. Yeah. But this time frame of now through August 15th is what puts your name in those drawings. Perfect. Is there a certain place that they should go to yes. register for this? Yeah, you can go to um, either our Facebook page, page, which is GLM2 Foundation Inc., mm-hmm. or our website, which is www.glm2.life. Awesome. Yeah, I'll, I'll put the tags or the yeah. links for those in the show notes for yeah, this yeah, so people can just click and, and go directly there. As, yeah, as well. that would be perfect. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, that's This was awesome. This is a, uh, it, it was a heavy conversation, but I think it's extremely important to talk about something like this um, and educate people and know that, you know, it is happening and it's happening at alarming rates and we need to talk about it and we need to, to fix it. We need to curb the demand and deal with this. Um, so thank you. I'm going to leave the floor open for you to kind of plug GLM2 one last time and then we'll close up shop. Yeah. Um, like I said, uh, we, we always, always, always need, you know, financial donations. That's the biggest thing with, with 24 adults and 40 kids. It takes a lot of finances to, yeah. to fund people. And again, you're looking at a, a you know, a five year span be able to to help transform lives but that's the beautiful thing that we get to see we get to see life transformation we get to see people literally go from death to life and flourish so awesome well kimberly thank you so much you're doing god's work um i, I appreciate it thank you so much thank you good wow <laughs> it's heavy